Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm going to um, kick the session off um, with uh, just a brief overview, and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Simon, um, who will um, bring up the tool and walk through it. Um, so just wanted to set a little bit of, um, of context. Hopefully everyone can see um, some slides in front of them. Um, just to say they there will be um, there will be copies of the um, we've I think this is the third provider webinar um, and we've done a series of commissioner webinars. Um, all of the materials and FAQ, so questions that you ask today are all going to be pulled together and will be put on the LGA's website. So uh, please don't think that you frantically need to take notes, etc. There will be resources to go back to. Um, so um, yes, you know, we will um, things will be published um, and they will be on the, um, the LGA's website. Um, so the purpose of today is to run through the tool. Um, provide an opportunity to ask uh, questions in relation to the toolkit. For, so for those of you who have already picked up and started using it, you may have some specific queries. Some of you may be joining just to get an overview. Um, so Simon will walk through it um, and we will leave um, roughly 15 to 20 minutes at the end for, uh, for questions. Um, but there may be some questions during the course that, that Simon may pick up or, or respond to. Um, and actually, you may ask questions now and they may be covered during the course of, uh, of Simon's demo. Um, so the first thing to say, uh, probably uh, very importantly, is um, the work on the development of this started um, well over 12 months ago, actually. Um, so early last year, um, with the purpose of developing a modelling tool um, to support councils and providers um, using actual cost to understand more from, I suppose, the commissioner side, um, the business operating model, how services, um, how the commissioning arrangements impact um, in terms of the cost, and to, I suppose, take steps, um, incremental steps towards a more sustainable, more vibrant market. So um, that being said, um, it is more than a data collection tool. Obviously, um, it predates the DHSC uh, request, but has become a tool for authorities and providers to support them through the um, through the market sustainability and fair cost of care exercise. But we just want to flag that it is more than just simply a data collection tool, and that's an important um, it's an important point to make um, because um, you know the the value of it isn't just about reporting on what is the actual cost now, but actually building um, sustainable operating models, uh, certainly from a commissioner perspective, um, that will help yourselves as providers. So um, the toolkit's uh, freely available for those of you who haven't actually um, um, downloaded or accessed it yet. Um, it's accessible through the um, LGA, um, the LGA's website, um, and um, we'll post a link in the in the chat um, so that people can uh, um, people can be directed towards it. That will also be the place where things like the FAQs, um, some of the videos, etc., um, of the, the demos will be will be stored. Hopefully, uh, during the course of, of, uh, of Simon walking through the tool, you'll start to see some of the benefits that we um, we originally designed this tool for. Um, principle being that there's a structure um, there's transparency, there's a means by which commissioners and providers can walk through and understand from both perspectives, um, but volume and operating model, um, what a sustainable uh, commission arrangement looks like um, from a commissioner perspective. And this is certainly we've done a lot of work over the last 12 months with commissioners. It supports their understanding of, of your businesses so that um, they can I suppose understand the cost that you're incurring and therefore make arrangements that are, that are, are suitable um, to support your local market. And on the basis of that, it will provide um, foundations for improvements in commissioning arrangements. So a lot of work that we've done with authorities initially, especially during the course of last year, was using not just the gathering of data, but the modelling to say, well, what does the future specification or arrangements for commissioning look like? Um, and then a couple of final points and then I'll, I'll hand over to Simon. Um, this we absolutely advocate the use of actual cost 
uh, and we're not advocating a price. We don't believe that there is one uniform price. Markets will differ greatly in relation to geography, in relation to local labour market, in relation to commissioning arrangements, um, and therefore this is about actual cost within a market. Um, so I'm just going to walk through the tool. You are going to see some numbers and we've put the numbers word in red because that's illustrative of you will see numbers that are in red. These are purely illustrative. So in previous sessions, we've had questions about, well, that's not what we pay or that's not what though the, the numbers are just to bring the model to life. We are not advocating a pay rate or what it costs for insurance or anything like that. It's just to show how the model works. Um, and just that final point that I, I made earlier about um, it is freely available um, on the LGA's website um, and we will put a link in the, the chat. So I'll hand over to, to Simon now to uh, walk you through. Um, as John as John had introdu introduced, we obviously we started this journey way before the market sustainability and fair cost of care um, requirements. Um, but of course, the LGA we've been working with the LGA and and that kind of close connection with DHSC. Um, there was um, you know there there is obviously um, reference to use of the toolkit in the guidance, and we're we're agnostic of um, how costs get, get costs get gathered um, or collated. As I say, um, as, as John said, um, ARC developed this toolkit really to bring the business operating model of home care and associated kind of community care models. You know, you can use this for supported living, you can use it for um, for other th other other um, types of community settings to 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 greater greater or lesser extents. But we are we're agnostic of, of providers individually picking it, this up for kind of forecasting or budgeting purposes if they want to use it for that or um, commissioners in terms of their own internal kind of um, fee setting and, and cost modelling. Um, it is just for home care services. Um, the care homes, um, I, I believe that there is another model for care homes that's being, it's not ARC, it's, um, it's another organisation, but they're, they're, I think they're releasing something in um, uh, a week or two. So, um, so yeah, so this one, um, this one is, is just predominantly in relation to um, home care provision or domiciliary care if you, um, if you, if you prefer to use that parlance. Um, I've um, I've got the toolkit on the screen, so I'm going to I'm going to spend the majority of the next probably about the next hour. We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end for um, just to pick up some questions, which will be dutifully triaged for me um, as we go through. But um, I'll I'll spend about an hour going through the model. Um, Obviously, every single business and every local authority, if, if a local authority asks you to complete this, um, but or as a provider, if you choose to complete this yourself, every single business and, and what you represent in terms of cost is going to be different. Um, what we can advise is how the model works and technically what, what things um, should go where in terms of that modelling, um, which is what I'll, I'll focus on today. Um, I'll, obviously, you can see that there's lots of text on the screen. Um, please do, please do take note and read through. We've we've tried to put um, every bit of kind of guidance, notes, commentary in the model is there to aid you to direct you as to what things do and um, what the what the input is um, in terms of that that question. So so that you that you get that sense of what what the toolkit will do. So <clears throat> um, please obviously do um, do take note of some of the some of the commentary. Um, we've got a bit of a legend at the top as well. So when you see different colours, obviously you can see that everything as I scroll down um, the the toolkit is sectioned. So um, we've got a section for the volume of, of care delivery. So the care hours and visit breakdown. We've got a section for travel time. Um, and, and obviously as we go down, we've got different sections and um, within each of these, you will see that there is a, a sorry, obviously a, a title and a bit of text and then typically a table or two. Um, the bits for you to be able to input are in green and in uh, this kind of salmon pinky red colour. Um, so anything in green is either free text. Um, so obviously you can type things in for information or there might be a choice. So there is um, there's a couple of things. Um, this this 
cell here, for instance, you can see there's a little drop down and you can choose the variable there that you want to apply. So whether it's number of services, monthly hours, weekly hours or visits. So some of these will have drop downs. Some of these, um, such as the visit types up here, are just free text. So you can say um, LA 60 minute visit, which will obviously just denote what you're putting in that top row there relates to the volume of 60 minute visits for the local authority that you may be commissioned for or, or, or whatever it might be. So um, again, just things to be able to note um, so that you can add things in. Um, we've obviously it is a spreadsheet, um, so it's not infinite in terms of the number of kind of um, rows that you can add to this. We've had to lock it down because obviously there's formulas in here, um, but also for usability of the model. Um, so, you know, we wanted to make sure that the mo most people as possible could could use the model. Um, which meant that we couldn't we couldn't obviously add um, tens of rows for every every different permutation. But there are ways and means of you to be able to put things in that, that are representative of your business as well. So we tried to be as flexible as we possibly could with that. Just a last note on the on the legend. Um, uh, uh, everything in everything in red is obviously a number, as, as John had um, referenced in his introductory slides. Um, so these these are really the critical fields that will obviously drive the production of, of kind of costs and things in the model. Um, Anything that's in white or in um, like you can see, like the little total rows here is uh, of just a formula. So um, typically you wouldn't be able to click into to those, um, but all it does is it just obviously calculates uh, annual versions of things. So if we've asked for a number of visits per week, for instance, um, then it will translate. So for instance, in this table, the, the visit length and the number of visits at that visit length will translate into a contact hours per week here. Um, travel hours per week is calculated from the travel section down here, which I can go through. Um, so yeah, so these are all just representations of figures that, that um, a user has input. There are, there are no other kind of assumptions built into the model, let's say, or, or um, kind of numbers other than the fact that, you know, there are 52 weeks in a year. So when we annualise something, we multiply it by 52 to represent a year. Um, and obviously that's something that you don't have to enter. That's just a formula. The other thing that's an assumption as well is that there are, you know, we count a full time equivalent day as seven and a half hours. But obviously, if for what if um, for costing purposes um, want to count it as an eight hour day, then obviously every full time equivalent for your organization would just be 1.07 because that's eight over seven and a half, which the model uses. So a full time equivalent um, for, a, for a 40 hour week might be 1.07, for instance. Um, but those that is literally the extent of the of the assumptions that are built into the model. Everything else is driven by what um, what the user inputs. Um, and I'll go through and, and explain how the model works. Um, oh, just a just a just a final thing on on kind of comments and legend. Actually, um, you'll see when you click into various boxes, this the the little comment boxes come up, um, and it will change based on what you click. So it will tell you. So that's just a a, a little tool tip to tell you what um, what to do in that cell. Um, this rather annoyingly, um, it will open up when you click it and it will kind of um, cover over half of the stuff that you're clicking onto. And um, just to prevent it from happening, once you open the spreadsheet up, if you just click and drag the box over to the side, over to a bit of blank space, um, you it will always stay there. So regardless of whether you, where you click in the spreadsheet, obviously you can see that the, the tooltip changes, but it won't move away from where you've put it. So you can kind of move it out of the way as soon as you as soon as you open up and that won't bother you. Um, the other ones as well, you can see that there are some, um, they're typically column headers that are in this little red um, red box with a little um, triangular flag in the corner. If you hover over those, it will give you some more information about calculations in the model. Um, and, and I'll go on to, I'll, I'll land on this one as we talk about the volumes, the volume calculation. Um, <coughs> um, just as a point around how it calculates visits and, and kind of, I guess one point to note is with respect to double up calls. 
when you're costing when you're costing the um, oh sorry when we're when we're trying to cost the um the cost of a visit is obviously doubled when we have two staff visiting one one customer um so um each individual visit has to represent an individual staff member so for instance if you are if you've got double up visits that should be counted as two visits in the model because it's about the number of staff visits being completed, not the number of customer visits being received. Um, so the customer will receive one visit, but it'll be two staff, so it's two staff visits. So for the purposes of costing, make sure that double ups are counted as two two separate visits. Um, and then obviously you'll um, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to count that accurately. Um, just a, I'm, I'm just going to pick up on a question about the number of visits per week for each visit type for local authority care only um, doing our private hours of care we deliver. Um, this is entirely up to you how you do it, but also up to how if, if a local authority has asked you to complete the toolkit, how they want you to complete it. Our advice and guidance is that what you should be modelling is your entire business costs. So what that means is you have you should really include all of the volume because if you if you're a branch, let's say, or a provider and, and um, from a single branch, you generate a million pounds worth of income in a year. Um, and um, I don't even know if these numbers work out, so forgive me if they don't, but but let's say 20,000 hours were of that income was from local authority care, 20,000 hours was from um, independent self under care. The total volume of the business was 40,000 hours um, and the costs, the costs associated with that volume um, was obviously to deliver that 40,000 hours. So you, you may have had a single registered manager that does all of that business. You might have um, a, a team of schedulers, co care coordinators that will will schedule for, lot, for all of those hours. So um, our, our advice would be to include all of your business costs and all of the business volume. What that means for, for, for kind of modelling purposes is it then it then becomes irrelevant the 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 fee rate or, or the income you get from each of those different customers. So if your local authority pays pays a different fee rate to your self funders, for instance, it doesn't matter because what you will get uh, what you will get in the model is um, obviously down here is an average blended unit cost per care hour. So it, it's irrespective of the individual fee rate, which is why obviously if you do the exercise and you include everything. Um, you might obviously local authorities should expect that if if you're if they're asking you for costs in your business, there is there should be no expectation that that um, necessarily tallies up with the the you know the, the care the, the price per care hour that that a local authority pays because you, you know the way that you distribute your business is across all of your volume of, of hours isn't it and you've obviously you, uh, a lot of a lot of um, providers not every provider but a lot of providers will probably have a mixed economy of how that income is generated so hopefully hopefully that um <clears throat> that answers that one um But just just when it comes to um, uh, blah, 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 blah. just when it comes to kind of directing the split of visits um, the the main the main variable to note here is not necessarily whether it's a, a 60 minute visit for a local authority or a 60 minute visit for a self funder, for instance, it's just the different lengths of visits. So, for instance, if um, if you deliver 60 minute visits and um, you deliver 200 a week to self funders and 200 a week to local authorities, for instance, then it, it would make sense to just combine those two lines because the model makes no differentiation between the volume that's delivered to one customer or another. As long as the visit length that you are planning or delivering for cost purposes is the same, that's the critical figure. Um, so um, if you have more than diff more than eight different visit lengths, um, then um, yeah, unfortunately there is a limitation in the model, um, uh, which means that you might not be able to split out every single visit length. But if you if you have more than eight different, if you if you have less than eight different visit lengths, but more than eight different visit types, that means that you might have a 45 minute for a local authority and a 45 minute for a self funder. You, there's no reason to to have to split those out. Um, necessarily from a from a modeling perspective, a technical perspective as to how the model calculates things, because it won't make a difference. Um, 
So that would be um, that would be my view on that one, I guess. Um, what I would say is the important thing to note is regardless of whether you split something out or you don't, the only thing from a cost perspective that you're technically concerned about is what's the average visit length. So one could, a provider could or a commissioner could say, well, I know that I delivered, um, I, I don't know, 2000 if i if i know in a typical week i delivered um uh, two and a half thousand hours worth of care and i delivered um uh, i delivered three thousand visits sorry then what i could do here is um i did three thousand visits sorry yeah three thousand visits and that those three thousand visits were delivered two and a half thousand hours worth of care uh, all right. Sorry, wrong way around. Two and a half thousand hours worth of care divided by three thousand visits, um, and then I, obviously I just need to multiply that by sixty because the, this particular cell that I'm typing in asks for the visit length in in minutes. Then I know that across those two and a half thousand, across those three thousand visits, my average visit length was fifty. Um, so all I need to do, I could do the entire volume of my business in one line, one single row. So I never have to worry about how many rows there are in here. If I then also put in 3000 visits, that will give me contact hours per week of two and a half thousand. So um, because the model was only really concerned with the this split. The reason why this split is so important is because the average visit length impacts your cost when it comes to travel or or in 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 a lot of businesses, not all, but but in a lot of businesses, the visit length will impact on travel time. And I say in a lot, in a lot, not all, because it depends how you physically pay for travel time. So some providers might pay for travel time um, and say, well, it's included in the hourly rate for care. So obviously, if we if you include um, a proportion of time, a pr proportion of pay for travel, but you only pay physically pay for the face to face care hours that get delivered, then you don't need to necessarily worry about this unless you vary that depending on the actual travel time and you pay for actual travel time as per ECM um, because that's going to impact cost because a shorter visit length on average is going to give you a higher unit cost because it doesn't take a, a, any longer or shorter period of time to deliver a 60 minute visit as it does a 30 minute visit. If the service user is four miles away and it takes uh, 12 minutes to travel there or 15 minutes to travel there and you're going to pay for those 15 minutes to travel there, then uh, you know, you're, for, for a 30 minute visit, you are going to have to pay that carer for 45 minutes worth of time to get to a 30 minute visit. For a 60 minute visit, you're going to have to pay your carer for um, 75 minutes worth of time. So the difference is in the proportion. So 15 minutes out of a 60 minute care time is, is obviously 25%, whereas 15 minutes out of a 30 minute care time is 50%. So the impact of travel cost is really, really important when it comes to the model. Um, so I just wanted to stress that because it will show you the impact of on average shorter visit lengths on cost, as long as you obviously pay, pay in that way. Um, you can see here that um, I'm gonna just um, move it back to what I had before. Um, but you can see here the travel percentage of total is um, uh, essentially essentially um, describes that situation that I just talked about. So for 60 minute visits, when you add together the contact and travel hours, travel makes up 8% of that total between those two. For a 30 minute visit for, um, for the contact hours and travel, travel makes up 14% of that total. So it's a significant difference because actually what you're saying is it's almost almost double travel impact um, for for a 30 minute visit as it is a 60 minute visit. Um, so we wanted to kind of um, we wanted to kind of illustrate that point. Um, the next section when it comes to <clears throat> when it comes to travel time and mileage expenses. Um, is just basically asks us for uh, two, two or three main aspects here for costing purposes. So, <coughs> so um, in terms of travel distance in miles, what we're really looking at here is the average travel distance that you pay per visit. Now, 
the organisation might express this in all sorts of different ways. What you might know, what you might know or be aware of is just the number of miles you paid for at the end of the month, for instance, or at the end of the year. So if that's the if that's your um, your understanding of the information you have to hand it as per your organisation, for instance, then the critical thing that you're interested in here is this 65,000 miles, because what that's saying is if I deliver 1,250 visits a week across the entire year on average and um, there is a one mile um, per visit that I had to pay in expenses, then I know then the model is telling us that that equates to 65,000 miles that had to be paid for in terms of mileage expenses. Um, so regardless of whether this per visit travel distance is accurate or not, um, you should be able to recognise the per annum mileage or the per annum mileage cost. And obviously there's a there's a little um, uh, there's a little comment box that shows you about um, uh, just an, another note about mileage expenses as well. Um, but that cost really is driven by this mileage here. And the mileage travel expenses per mile. Excuse me. <clears throat> Apologies, I ate my Weetabix a little bit too fast this morning. <coughs> um, so that's that's how that gets calculated. So um, you know, one sixty-five thousand miles at thirty-five pence a mile means the organisation um, paid twenty-three twenty-three thousand um, pounds. So if you recognise that as the cost in your organisation, then obviously that should be accurate. Um, just a note as well with regards to you know what time period and 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 how often um how frequent these things get captured um the model lasts for this per week but obviously if you if you only capture this on a monthly or an annual annual basis then um you know the very very simplistic way to get to well what's the per week value if it's if you capture it monthly then let's say it's 2000 visits a month times 12 um which gives us an annual value. Um, and then if I just divide that all that by 52, I get 462 week visits a week. Um, you can also, if you wanted to just be um, a bit quicker about it, you could times that monthly visits by, I think it's about 4.33, because on average, not every month has the same amount of weeks in it. And I think on average over the year, it's about 4.33 weeks, something like that. Um, so that will, that will also give you, oh, sorry, Rob, divide by 4.33 to give me the number of weeks. So it's a 462, so it's the exact same thing, um, albeit doing it, multiplying it by 12 and then dividing by 52 is a bit more accurate than just dividing by 4.33. But it's it, it's irrelevant which way you do it. As long as you can work out from your annual visits, from your monthly visits, what the weekly what the weekly average is, that's absolutely fine. And again, that, that's a relatively simple thing to calculate. <clears throat> um, so that's that's travel expenses in terms of mileage and how that applies to the model. Uh, when it comes to travel time per visit, as I explained above, um, we calculate the travel hours per week based on this travel time here. So what the model assumes is that the care is going to get paid for their contact hours and they are also going to get paid separately for their travel hours at the exact same rate. So they don't revert to national minimum wage. They don't revert to any other type of cost. They, they stay at that contact. They stay at that rate for contact time when they're traveling as well. If you are an organization that doesn't pay travel time separately, then you don't need to put any figure in this travel time per visit, because if you put a figure in here, it's going to multiply a cost that is not practically incurred by your organization. Um, uh, because instead there's a bit I'll, I'll get onto this further down, but the direct stat, the, the hourly rate card, which is in section E here, um, is the bit that tell that multiplies all of those hours up. So if, it, if you're asking the, the if you're asking the um, rate card to multiply travel time when you don't pay for travel time, then that cost is going to be shown in the model, which is not necessarily incurred by the business um, because your hourly rate is going to be higher on average anyway. So that's just an important point to make about that. If 
um, you pay in um, a, 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 a more granular way, which is which is to say that you actually do calculate travel time by via some ECM or or some other some other fashion. You know, people submit mileage mileage time uh, travel time, for instance, on their pay slips. Then um, it just asks you for an average travel time per visit. Now, again. The critical thing for you to check if you're saying, well, how do I know whether that's accurate to what I pay? It's this cost here. So £52,576 is what this organisation um, uh, incurred as a cost specifically for paying their carers for travel time. So regardless of what that number is, let's say that you as an organisation paid um, blah, 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 for <coughs> Let's say, let's say it was your pay bill for travel was 40k. Um, thanks, John. <clears throat> John, um, the let's say your um, your pay bill was 40k for travel, and you just know that because you pay it separately on your pay slips. Um, then you can just put in the travel time that reflects the pay cost that you incurred. So it's irrelevant of whether 3.8 minutes is accurate or not, as long as 40k is accurate. Um, just pop that back. Um, just in case you are, um, you, you've got a, a, a relatively more granular model in your business and you actually want to model this based on what your actual travel time is and that kind of stuff and mileage expenses. Um, a, a, a useful check that we put into the model is this average travel speed. So based on the fact that we've got average travel distance of a mile and then average travel time per visit of five minutes, basically what this is telling us, we are making an assumption in here that we can travel at 12 miles an hour between each visit on average. Um, in an urban area, that's probably quite accurate. Um, I wouldn't expect you to have an average travel speed of like 30 miles an hour in the middle of a set town centre because that assumes that you're running red lights and there's no traffic whatsoever. So um, 12 miles an hour is probably something like reasonable. If it's a more rural area, I would expect that speed, that average speed as a kind of a check, check and challenge to 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 whether it's um, whether it's showing you something reasonable or not would be a lot higher. So, you know, you might you might travel 20, 20, 25, 30 miles an hour in a more rural area. But that's not to say that the mileage, the distance between those visits and the travel time between those visits is going to be higher as well. It's just the proportion will be slightly different. Um, so that's travel time and mileage expenses. Um, the next section then talk, moves on to um, just giving us some information more generally around the volumes in the business that we've modelled so far. So for, for the branch and volume summary, we've only got one kind of user input in this section. The rest of this is just um, information that tells us something about the, the branch. Um, so in this model, given the fact that we've put in our, our visits and we've put in our travel time, um, then what that tells us is that this branch is saying that it delivered 65,000 visits in the 12 month period that it's, that it's costing for, um, and it delivered 42,900 face-to-face hours um, in within those 65,000 visits. Um, in addition, we've also costed for 5,417 travel hours. Um, so the total contact and travel hours 48317 is the thing that we use for, for, for calculating cost, um, not the 42900, which is why I explained if you don't pay for travel, then that should practically speaking be zero. Um, but again, it gives us some information here. Um, it also tells us what the average kind of package size, let's say in terms of the number of hours that a service usually is being delivered per week. Um, it tells us that here and it tells us that because what it asks us is the average number of service users. From a cost perspective, the average number of service users is, um, is used um, by way of calculating CQC fees. So <clears throat> for CQC fees, um, the, um, the, the, obviously the way that personal care, dom uh, domiciliary community care is, is costed or, or you get this invoice from CQC, you get a branch fee, so a fixed fee per branch and then a fee per service user. Um, and obviously this 70 here should be representative of the number of service users, users the branch was charged for. So it might be slightly different because you might, you might take on some clients where you're not necessarily delivering personal care as per the, um, you know, the, the, the personal care requirements. Um, so they might not be costed in for, for the for the fact for the purposes of CQC clients. 
<clears throat> excuse me, our CQC costs. Um, so obviously, if you want to be accurate about it, then you can exclude the service users for, from that perspective. But um, it, it's a relatively small difference. So um, I, again, you'd have to be directed to um, either how you want to fill it in or how you be how you are directed to fill it in. Um, um, we're not. Um, um, there's no there's no particular um, mandate to fill this in in any particular way other than you understanding the impact this has on costs. As long as you understand the impact that putting a certain number in has on the cost, then you can understand how you're going to affect the model um, in that way and you can affect it at, at, at will in whichever, whatever way you obviously purport to do that. So, so that's just an explanation of how the service user bit works. I'm the branch capacity. I'm not going to go through the branch capacity um, in this session because I think um, I've covered it in previous sessions and there are recordings. And also we've got um, uh, we'll, I'll make a mention at the end of the session as well about the um, the help desk, um, the, the the email address, and the mailbox that we've set up as ARC to to support providers with understanding what various bits of the model do. But um, suffice to say that the model assumes when you open it up, so when you, once you once you open this up for the first time or you download it from the LGA website, um, uh, this will just assume that you are modelling for a single branch at a time. Um, when it comes to modelling for multiple branches, so this is probably more of a, um, a, 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 use, a use case for commissioners um, who would be looking at um, an entire kind of neighbourhood, locality or, or sub-region or region within their local authority. Um, this this can be used to model the total volumes across all of the care that gets commissioned. So let's say that a local authority commissions um, 10,000 contact hours a week of care. Obviously, this branch is only delivering less than a tenth of that. So you have to make some kind of estimation of how big a branch can get before you have to employ another branch to um, to cover all of the care needs in a, in a particular region. So that's really what we use this for. So for instance, if we've got a large number of contact hours, I'm just going to go on to the monthly one, 3575 here. So that might be typically the, the number of hours that a, a branch could handle, for instance. If a branch can only handle, if a branch can only handle, um, let's say a fifth of that, then what this is going to, what the model is going to do, and you say, well, actually my capacity, my branch capacity is, um, a fifth of that, then obviously it's going to say total number of branches required to fulfil this demand is now five instead of one. Um, and that's obviously just because I did a very simplistic calculation and you know exactly why I divided by five, so it says five. Um, the reason why that's important is because when it comes to the infrastructure costs, so that's everything to do with all of the back office costs here, um, all of the overheads, so things like rent rates, utilities, IT, all of these things have to be multiplied depending on the number of branches you have. So you need five times worth of the IT costs for one branch as you do to to um, to deliver five times the amount of volume because one branch cannot do that. So the cost per annum, this this last column on the spreadsheet here is basically multiplied by that um, that branch um, that that cell there. Um, but it's agnostic when we're looking at unit cost per care hour, it doesn't actually make a difference because we just multiplied something by the same by the same proportion that we divided it in another cell. So um, so it makes no difference when it comes to unit cost per care hour, <coughs> which is why I say it's not it's not too important for, for um, providers to worry about. Unless again, unless you know you want to take this, you want to use the modeling house to say, well, look, I've got multiple branches. I want to work out what my what my total budget costs are across all of those branches and what the blended unit rate should be across all of those branches. That's helpful for you to do, because if you're a group company or if you're a company with multiple branches, it's going to help you with that. Um, next section PPE. So um, we've we've gone into a little bit more detail with PPE than than um, typically you you might you might see on other models. So you might just have a line which is kind of uniforms, consumables, um, PPE, for instance. Um, obviously, not least because of the pandemic. Um, you know there is there has been a heightened need for all of this um and also the fact that i know currently it's being um the the government portal is being extended until the end of march 23 so 
um, in large part, the cost incurred to organisations is not going to be um, the full cost of PPE. I know some organisations will still buy their own because, you know, whatever, whatever the government portal provides is not what they want to use or it's not it's not appropriate. Um, but um, there will obviously be a lot of organisations that don't necessarily have a have a cost for this currently, but we are trying to future proof this. We're not we're not thinking about, oh, well, it's not necessary because it's not a cost. The reality is, well, at some point it will be, you know, it won't be free forever. We won't be able to order from the government portal forever. So we have to include something of the ilk for PPE costs. Um, and the way that we've done this, there's a there's a very kind of simple calculator in here which says um, if we assume that we're buying some uh, single use consumables, let's say so, um, I mean, visor, for instance, might be multiple use, but, um, it, you know, face mask might be multiple use, but, you know, for in large part, these kind of disposables, um, then we will probably buy um, on bulk, so we'll have a cost per unit. Um, we'll need to specify the items required per visit. Now, this is an average, not a not a total. So uh, there will be some visits where you will have multiple activity tasks on a care plan that require you to change your gloves. For instance, you might have to change your gloves three or four times in a visit. Um, um, but other visits, you know, if it's like a shopping visit or something else, you might not need any gloves at all. So the answer is not to put, you know, the the, the three or four or zero. It's it's just an estimation of the average number of items across all of the visits that I'm going to apply some PPE to. Um, so that's what the items required per visit does, uh, just multiplies that cost per unit. Um, and then the final one here is then the proportion of all of the visits that we apply the PPE cost to. So we're assuming here there's 1,250 visits per week in this organisation. Um, do we need to apply PPE for every single one of those, i.e. are they all personal care calls by which we need some form of barrier um, to to deliver that care. Um, obviously, I'd, you know, as an example, I just put 100%. Um, but you can you can make whatever estimation you need to make um, accurate to your organisation in there. Um, but that will essentially just cost up PPE for you. And obviously, this break this all breaks down into the cost per care hour down at the bottom. So you can you can check these things to see does that does that look reasonable? Does that look accurate? <clears throat> um, when it comes to the direct pay um, rate card, um, we've we've gone into a little bit more detail here around um, you know the the the, the variation of pay rates that organisations can have. Um, one of the um, one of the challenges that we we've, we've kind of seen in other models um, is that when you and I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom here. Just to just to um, enlighten this point, when you look at a, a typical cost breakdown on the hour of what does you know what does a, an hour's worth of dom care look like, um, you'll kind of get this top line of direct care, and it will say nine pound fifty, for instance. Which last year that was the real living wage rate. This year it's the national living wage rate, or nine pound ninety, which is the real living wage rate this year, or ten pounds, or whatever it is. It's a very flat rate, but it's it's an identifiable and recognisable rate. Um, and the and whatever breakdown the, um, the 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 models provided will just give you that. The reality is when you're trying to when you're trying to look at a business in terms of the whole year's delivery and you and you're actually looking at this on a on a PL basis, a budgeting basis, you don't deliver every single hour's worth of care at one rate. You will probably deploy different types of staff for different things and at different rates as well. Not least bank holidays is a big one as well because you know. If we say 950, well, that doesn't take into account the fact that some bank holidays we pay 50 percent or, you know, if it's Christmas and, and New Year's, we might pay double time even. Um, so it doesn't take that into account. So what we've done is we've we've developed this table which tries to which which um, not tries to it does. It, it calculates a, um, a blended rate across all of those hours, taking into account the fact that we pay different rates for different things. So. <coughs> excuse me. Um, so what we've done is the um, column on the left just dictates the types of staff that we might experience. We've put these three in green, which means that you can edit these because you might not have carers, you might have something different in your organisation, you might not have senior carers. 
if you don't deliver complex healthcare, um, you, you know, CHC clients or something like that, you might not, you probably won't have nurses. But again, these are um, these are, are, are malleable to whatever types of staff you deploy in your organisation. Um, and then obviously we've got a line for enhancements, which are typically might be something like short notice. So for instance, if you um, if you get some shifts where um, care is off sick and you have to ring round and get someone else on shift and you're going to have to pay them a pound extra, for instance, to to you know to get them to come in that day when they weren't scheduled to come in, and um, that happens. That happens all the time. So we have to take notice of things like that. Similarly, unsociable hours. So some pay um, slight enhancements for. Um, evening work or nighttime work, for instance. So you might want to use that as a as a kind of cost for for um, uh, an evening rate, for instance. But again, everything is asked for the the rate on the hour. Um, uh, and obviously, um, then we've got a line for salaried staff. So if you have team leaders, and typically, certainly the uh, the organisation I I was commercial manager for for a few years, we had um, we had an expectation that team leaders would do um, kind of like two. I think it was like two in five days or three in five days delivering care, and then two in five days of of um, office work, admin supervisions, that kind of thing. So this dictates the care delivery time for any kind of salaried staff as well. Um, so it adds that cost on. So we've got a basic rate for each of these different types of staff. Uh, then we've got an enhancement, which is just a premium. So obviously if you're weekend and you want to add on, um, I don't know, 10%, for instance, for a weekend, then you can see that the model will add 10% onto each of these rates to represent the weekend rate for those for that portion of hours that might be delivered at weekend. Uh, bank holidays, 50%, again, adds 50% onto the rate. The final column in here, um, which again is the is, is an important one, um, ensure that if you have different staff here paid at different rates and you want this blended rate to calculate accurately, that you need to apply a volume of hours to that member of staff. So the model assumes that 100% of calls are delivered by this kind of basic rate up at the top for um, the, the first line, which obviously in this example is a carer. Um, but if you want, and, and this is obviously, um, I can I can tell this is an anonymized example that I'm using on this one because it, we've got a 5.06%, which is obviously a very specific number. So they calculated that 2,500 or whatever for argument's sake, two, four, four, five hours were actually delivered at £11.50 an hour and variations of that ra rather than the £9.50 an hour basic rate here. So, so if you apply a percentage, it will reduce that top one to, and obviously it will, you need to just make sure that that adds up to 100% at the end as well. Um, but yeah, that's how you split the costs. Um, and then the table below will give you the blended cost for all of that care work and travel time. So um, you can see here the weighted cost or the or the blended average cost is now nine pounds ninety eight, not not nine pound fifty, which is just our basic rate. We've now taken into account the number of hours delivered and the pay rates delivered at different things, uh, different at uh, different types of care, different times, um, which gives us that that more accurate blended rate for the for the direct rate card. Uh, Non-contact related pay costs. So once we've done all of our travel and contact time and we've calculated the, the cost per annum, so this is an annualised cost, we, we, we're presuming we're, we're, we're looking at costs over a 12 month period here. So that's the annualised cost for, for our, for our um, kind of care delivery. We then need to add on all of our non-contact related pay costs. Um, and um, this is a much more simplistic um, table because um, obviously we typically apply, apply a, a percentage on top for these types of things, but also it's easier for calculating the cost in this column F here. So when it comes to things like holiday pay, sickness, maternity, paternity, um, uh, any other additional pay such as, you know, if we have like you know, an enhancement for agency rates and we deliver a proportion of these on agency, you can put in a blended rate for, for agency there or, or, a, or a percentage cost premium that you might have paid the agency themselves, for instance. You can use that for that kind of thing. But um, suffice to say, all of these um, rows here or cells here, excluding the training and supervision, I will go through that separately, um, but all of these just ask for a percentage on top of the number of hours here. 
<clears throat> so we take 48317 um, and then if we add 4% on top of that, then we'll get to, you know, 2000 hours worth of sickness that we had to pay for. And obviously the blended cost for sickness at, our, at the rate that we pay sickness, which is obviously the basic rate that we pay for sickness, um, cost us um, 18K in this instance. But obviously at least you know how that's calculated so that it will be whatever it will be for your organisation. Um, the only difference in this model will be for, for calculation purposes is when it comes to holiday pay. Um, so holiday pay, actually, um, we ap apply that percentage on top of all of these hours in addition to the um, hours up here, because obviously when you're on training, you accrue holiday. When you are sick, you accrue holiday. So you have to include all of these hours when you apply that percentage to get to the number of hours there to be accurate. Just a point on holiday and um, I put 12.07% there. I think that's kind of kept in when you download the model um, not say you can change it at will, but the, the, there's a there's a specific point as to why that's 12.07% and um, I got asked this from um, from a provider the other day about well, wouldn't that be wouldn't that be less for a um, for a, a someone on a zero hours contract? And um, actually the answer is no for a zero hours contract or anyone who has any variable hours. Um, the minimum amount of holiday pay and time that they need to accrue is 12.07%. The reason for that is when you calculate a full time equivalent year, i.e. 260 days a year is the kind of the maximum available working time that we have for a full time equivalent person. So if we assume a full time equivalent is five days a week for 52 weeks, then we get to 260 days. What we have to statutorily allow is out of those 260 days, we have to give at least 28 days in holiday and bank holiday time back to that person. So when you calculate that out, basically you can only deploy someone full time a maximum of 232 working days. So that's 260 minus 28. The proportions between the 28 and the 232, then if you do 28 divided by 232, just so happens to be 12.07%. So if you've got someone working 10 days in the week, the year, they will accrue 12.07% of those 10 days that they worked in holiday pay that you have to pay in addition. So that's why you say 12.07%. But again, the thing that you're checking is, is the cost accurate to the holiday cost that I paid in my organisation? If it's different, if it's something different, then obviously you can make the cost accurate to what you paid. Um, but if it's not, then obviously um, if that if that just so happens to be the right figure, then that's the right figure. But obviously, please do just check all of this stuff because um, you you want to make sure that this is accurate. I'm sure. Um, so that's that's holiday. That's the non-contact pay costs. Um, the The one that I didn't um, cover on here is training and supervision, and you will note that this is not a percentage. This is a number, so it doesn't have a percentage next to it. And the reason for that is obviously we specify that this is the full time equivalent days per staff member. So obviously when you hire, when you when you recruit someone, when you've got someone on either mandatory training or refresher training or induction training, it doesn't matter whatever they're doing in that 12 month period. There will obviously be an expectation that there is a number of um, hours worth of training that every single staff member has to attend. And this is regardless of the actual number of hours they are out delivering care. So if you've got a part time person on um, 20 hours a week, for instance, um, you will still need to give them the same amount of training and supervision time as someone who is on 40 hours a week. Um, <clears throat> You know, so so you don't you don't necessarily if you if you've got a training day and it's seven and a half or eight hours of a training day, um, the person that's on twenty hours a week doesn't doesn't get to leave halfway through the day. They have to be paid for the full day. So the proportion is different, um, which is why we say per staff member you have to have um, however many full days. Obviously, I've put five in the example, which is um, typically you know it might be like three full days worth of training courses, um, and then two days worth of supervision or or whatever it might be, or it might be five days worth of training and two days worth of supervision, whatever. And um, that's obviously needs to be accurate to your organisation. Um, but um, the one thing that I would say about that is obviously you'll note that when you go through the model because obviously when you download this all of these things will be completely blank and there's obviously a reason for them to be blank which is you need to fill these in with your numbers and um, 
if even if you put a number in there, you can see that that will show that will probably show zero um, unless you then scroll down and put a number in this row here, which I'll go into a second, which is the number of staff. Um, but just to say, um, if you put a number in there and it still shows zero, there's not a problem with the model. It's just because we haven't got enough information yet to actually calculate um, calculate what the cost should be. Um, so. Moving on then to my and just bridging quite conveniently to my next section. Um, how do we get our training costs in? Well, we need to tell it how many staff this organisation is going to train and how many staff this organisation actually has. Um, so what we um, what we do in this next section, which in the main pertains to employers, national insurance and pension costs, um, is um, the first thing that we need to add, need to tell the model is how many how many care staff on average did we employ over that 12 month period that we're costing for so um let's say I, I can't remember what the number was but i'm going to just i'll just put 50 in there for instance so 50 staff at five full-time equivalent days at the um at the at the rates that we've already dictated up up here um will then obviously give us a training cost give us a number of training hours and then the training cost of 18k on there so so that's why we have to put in a number of staff that we that we're using for our training cost as well again as with every single pounds and pence kind of um sell in this model um the most critical thing that you're checking is do i know what i actually paid out in training to um, carers to staff over the year and do I know that that was 17,800 if it was then I know that this is accurate if it wasn't then obviously it's just a you know it's just a manipulation of that figure to say well actually I paid 12k so um, you know the average is and the model is is 3.4 whatever it was um, but yeah so these numbers here are the ones that you're checking to say was that right um so then we've got employers and our pension costs. So I'll, I'll, I can go on to this section G now that I've, I've introduced the average care staff per annum. Um, so again, we're looking at the direct. So we're not looking at back office costs in this in this instance. We, we've still got to do um, we still got to do um, uh, something separate for back office costs. So we're just looking at those those care staff that we're deploying on ground um, to deliver care hours, um, which are the essentially the variable costs not the fixed costs which is things like back office and overheads um, so we've got 50 staff in here um, uh, and then what the model tells us is based on the number of hours that we have to pay so that's not just the travel and contact hours that's the um, holiday pay that's the training that's everything else what that means is the number of hours per staff member per week that we are paying for is 22.9 now in a lot of organisations, I wouldn't necessarily expect that figure to be 37 and a half or 40 hours, because as you can see in the little tool tip, in the little comment box, if 100% of our care staff were employed on full time equivalent contract, then this figure would equate to 37 and a half hours per staff per week, because that's what we'd be paying for. In reality, obviously, we know that um, most care staff in this sector are on either zero hours or some kind of variable contract, um, which might not be 37 and a half hours. So th th this figure should really be representative of the average across that that, that staff base. Um, the reality is I know, and again, we employed people who would work no more than 16 hours a week, you know, so that so they would go up to 16 hours a week and they wouldn't take any more shifts. Um, and we'd have some staff that would work 40 hours a week quite consistently. They would they would be more than happy to take every hour going. So it's not to say that that figure has to be one extreme or the other. It has to be the average or the blended average across all of the care staff as a sense check to making sure that the model is showing you something that looks accurate to your organisation. Of course, when it comes to modelling, if you then want to say, well, what would it cost me to employ everyone on full time equivalent uh, contracts? How many staff would I need? Um, oh, less than that, let's do 30. OK, well, look at that, 37.6. So if I if I had 30 staff and in an ideal world, I could split my schedule of, of visits out at out evenly enough that every single staff member could visit every single um, uh, um, customer um, in the right time and all of that kind of stuff, then to get to 37 and a half hours a week, obviously I need 30 staff. That will obviously affect your training bill and it will affect your employers and I bill as well. Because
Um, when it comes to pension, um, there's two different ways of doing pension, um, and this is dependent on whether you have the same pension for your back office team as to whether you have it for, for, for frontline staff. If you have all sorts of different pension schemes and, and, and there's a more granular level of detail that you want to apply, unfortunately, again, we can't cater for everything because you know it, the model is quite complex as it is and just there's there's a limit to how much you can add before um less and less people utilize utilize what it's offering so so we have to put a kind of limit on that but um the two things that we ask for as user inputs in the model here is the percentage of staff opt out so this is the um percentage of staff that have have um you do not pay a pension for because obviously the scheme is opt out it's not an it's not an opt in anymore um so obviously that variable there is zero which means that in this example every single staff member has to be has to have pension costs accrued and um, if you were to put 100 percent in here what that means is obviously and you can see you can you can see immediately that it's then it's then saying there's no cost for pension um, so what that means is 100 percent of our care staff have opted out of the pension um, and therefore um, there's no pension contribution um, but um, typically there's going to be levels of in between um, you know we've had we've had providers that have 80 percent of their staff have opted in so you know the opt out is 20 percent um, we've had staff where we've had providers where 50 percent of staff have opted out so that can be accurate as per your organization but again the number there, the cost there is the one that you check. And so if, we, if, you, if you're using your accounts at the end of the year to fill this in and you see a pension cost there, that's the cost that you should be looking for to, 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 get, it, to get it accurate. Um, the pension percentage, so obviously the, as, as, as standard, it's, it's the employer's contribution to pension is 3%. Um, the model um, is irrespective of whether you apply this above the lower earnings limit or not. So um, what I would say is if you if you just look at this cell here, which is I 114, that 11769 is the average gross cost per staff per annum. And obviously, if you're say if your organisation pays pension contributions above the lower earnings limit for the staff member, then what you need to be cognizant of from a from a pension perspective when you're costing up the pension you need to you need to take the average staff cost and you need to um, take the lower earnings limit off that which is what i've just done here as a, as a quick formula which is 5529 because that's the portion of every member every staff member's cost that i'm going to apply a pension contribution to i'm going to apply it at three percent but if i want to figure out what what the cost is as per that three percent then um oh, sorry i'm just gonna just put this as a percentage here 47 percent. so actually 47 percent of the three percent is actually the right is actually the more accurate cost in in my organization if i'm applying above the foot the lower earnings threshold so if i do equals three percent times 47 percent here um then obviously it's actually for 1.4 so obviously 1.4 percent is my 8k so you don't need to do that calculation. I'm showing you that calculation to to um, hopefully inform in terms of how lower earnings limit works and how the impact of lower earnings limit works. But again, if you're if it costs you eight point eight thousand three hundred as an organisation in pension, then you know that one, putting one point four percent in this model will give you that cost. Obviously, this model is unique because it's got all sorts of other variables in it, but yours might be slightly different. But again, you're looking for that cost as a confirmation. Um, that's it for all of our variable costs um, <clears throat> for our for our back office for our kind of fixed costs and I appreciate that they're not always fixed because if you go over a certain threshold in terms of volume you might have to have another care coordinator another scheduler in your back office so then that becomes a fixed cost um, but it's variable based on thresholds of care volumes that kind of stuff um, but typically from an from a accounting perspective or an economic perspective uh, these are these are these are kind of fixed costs as opposed to variable costs in an organisation. So everything from section H onwards is um, it relates to kind of overheads. Um, so just the last point on this pension, the there's a little thing here used for which says use for back office pension question mark. Um, uh, uh, this is by default. Yes, but if you were to do the little drop down and click no, what you can see the next table down in the back office, we've got this column opens up here, which is the manual pension. So 
what this essentially means is if you've got a registered manager, for instance, that you have on a different pension scheme to the rest of the staff, then you can vary that that 3% wouldn't necessarily apply. So, so you'd have to put a different thing in. So we've put that little bit of variability in the model to say if you if you need to vary the cost, then you can do when, with respect to pension when it comes to your back office stuff. Um, but in the main, when it comes to back office costs, there are only two things that you need to really um, uh, put in here from a, from a costing perspective. Um, we've we've obviously entered, put a little table in to say these are the typical types of back office costs when it comes to home care. Again, it's been tailored for home care, not to say it can't be used for other other um, other types of service. Um, but um, you know, there's just some examples, but not not being restrictive about the types of staff you know there's going to be all sorts of other back office staff that may be employed directly in the branch so you know you might have hr marketing you might have quality assurance you might have an assessment officer um because and i know i know this because this is the, the type of staff that we employed um but we can't cover everything and we know every provider is going to be different so we've just offered some some additional lines here in green that you can add in the extra staff as per your your business now, when it comes to costing up the, so this FTE salary cost column F here is, um, is the gross salary cost for those individuals in the business. Um, and obviously you can see here, um, I've put in, um, or sorry, this is, this is obviously a, um, uh, someone's, someone's filled this in as per, as per the FTE that they have. Um, so they've put in 0 0.93, which I can see here from the formula is just, um, it's obviously they employ them for 35 hours a week, not 37 and a half, which is why they've got the FTE as, as 9.93. Um, and then um, the gross pay per hour is 20 pounds, which gives them a full-time equivalent salary cost of 39,000. So that should that gross cost there should obviously be the, the cost for that registered manager and then they add on the employers and i and the pension to get to the total cost so so this is this is the cost with on costs included um for, for, for those of you that are familiar with that vernacular um <clears throat> but essentially um that's the that salary cost there is the thing that you should recognize as the gross pay to the individual uh, and obviously you can amend the the pay pay rate the hourly pay rate to suit whatever that that comes out with um, so that's the back office costs. There are some additional back office costs that might not lend themselves to you putting in the number of full time equivalent and then the pay costs for those full time equivalent, such as, um, and here's the examples on call. So obviously this just gets paid as a payment per period and it's not necessarily a full time equivalent thing. It's just a, an additional payment that you have to incur as an organization if you if you run on call, for instance. Um, so you can put in the on call payment per period and then obviously you can select the period here. Um, weekly, four weekly, monthly, whatever it might be. Um, just ensure that the cost per annum here comes out accurate um, to 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 what you want. Um, central staff apportionment. So again, if you have multiple multiple branches um, operate in different regions, you have a central staff apportionment for things like marketing, HR, finance. Um, you're not necessarily in all instances going to know that you get 0.4 full time equivalent of a of a HR person for your branch. Excuse me, but what you will what you will probably know is how much you get charged for central staff costs, which is why we just said, look, it's the it's the cost for any central staff apportionments, regardless of what you you know. If you know the detail, great. Um, the model's not asking you in any way to try and figure that detail out. Um, so um, just wanted to just wanted to put point that one out. And then finally, last but not least, we've got the apprenticeship levy, which is calculated um, further on down the model. But I'll explain how that's calculated as well. Um, so that's all the pay related back office costs. Then we've got um, um, non pay related costs. So we've got overheads here. 
and we split these in two. Sorry, I'm just having a drink. Some as you can, you might be able to tell my voice is a little bit hoarse. <laughs> um, but non-pay costs, we've got um, congestion charge, low emission scheme, parking permits, vehicle lease. Um, vehicle lease was 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 one for me. We had a we had a pool car that obviously we could lend out to carers um, on either short notes. So if their, their car was in the garage, they were in their MOT or whatever it might be. Um, it was helpful to have a pool car, and I know and I know many providers. Um, find it find it um, helpful to have a pull car but obviously that cost needs to be included um congestion charge you know low emission scheme these are probably going to be specific to um certain organizations you know I, I, I don't know if you're in birmingham or if you're in if you're certainly if you're in london um you might have these kinds of costs attributed um but obviously they don't necessarily apply everywhere um, but we've put some travel related costs in there or some lines that you can you can obviously express those costs um, again um, doesn't ask for any detail other than what is the what, what was the cost of that per annum um, so if you if you're putting in two thousand pounds um, and then obviously the period is annually then it will just multiply it by one and then it's two thousand pounds you can see the multipliers down here in these yellow boxes um, <clears throat> um, but if you put that in quarterly it will obviously multiply it by eight out, by four. So um, obviously, just be just be cognizant that whatever you put in here, it will multiply it by the period to get the annual cost. Um, and then finally, in terms of actual cost, before we start looking at kind of profit surplus, um, operating surplus, that kind of stuff, um, is any other overhead. So um, and and obviously the big hitters are going to be things like rent, rates, utilities for your office space. Um, which again, you might get the bill quarterly, so or you might get it four weekly. A lot of things run on a four week rather than an actual month. So, whatever you get that in, whatever whatever kind of format or period you get that in, rather than having to calculate it in this instance, we've we've just given the option to be able to say express that as a as a monthly cost or whatever it might be. So and um, so that's the um, uh, that's rent rates, recruitment, DBS costs. So it could be um, you know job adverts that kind of stuff. Um, third party training costs. So this could be if you bring in a, um, a third party trainer, you have to pay them separately or if you have any certification um, uh, costs for apprenticeships, that kind of thing that are not covered in, in the levy per se, um, then obviously those, those are costs that, that will be incurred there. IT, uh, IT and telephony is obviously going to be um, probably if if not, certainly next to kind of rent rates and utilities is going to be the biggest cost incurred in the business. Um, if you have ECM, um, certainly because obviously you've got all of the costs of the hardware, all the costs of the telephony, that kind of stuff. So um, so we've put those in there. Stationary and postage, um, insurance, obviously uh, legal, professional fees, that kind of thing. Again, central head office recharges as well. So if there's anything that's not necessarily split out, but you know that there's a there's a central um, uh, central cost attributed to that, then you can express that here. Um, and, and finally, because we know that we'll never cover everyone, all all costs and when, um, um, and you know, everyone needs to express all of those costs or else the model won't be accurate if you if you actively choose to leave costs out um, then we've added additional overhead lines here to cover anything else so so there's all the headlines to say um, if there's other costs that you want to express differently then you could obviously put those in and it works in the same way Um, CQC registration fees you can see is a calculated cell at the bottom and as I explained earlier the calculated cell there um, is um, the CQC cal calculated here so it's the branch fee plus the plus the per service user fee to get to that cell and just whilst I'm on it the apprenticeship levy the this is again calculated as per the um, threshold so for instance if you have a pay threshold as an organization of over three million pounds gross then you get 0.5 percent of that charged as the levy if you're a if you're a branch within a larger provider organization then you're not going to have a branch pay bill of three million pounds um, yet you may get charged centrally at a cost for their central apportionment of the apprenticeship levy. In that case, it's irrelevant that something comes up here. You can just put the cost in the central staff apportionment because it's going to come in as part of a staff cost or you can put it in as a head office recharges. Um, again, the point is as long as you find a space to account for that cost and there's space to account for costs, um, 
you know, pop, pop, pop that in. Finally, I'm going a little bit over my 15 minutes that I said I would leave at the end, but I'm 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 fine with that to to a certain extent. Um, then he's just operating surplus. So obviously, the the uh, line here is um, just the expression of whatever that returned profit is at the end. So um, this will be inclusive of things like um, uh, interest and and corporation tax because you pay corporation tax out of your profit. So obviously the profit there, the the EBIT as as, as an accounting expression as we've expressed it here, is um, forty three and a half thousand. So whatever that value is, that has to be accurate to your organisation as well. So whatever percentage you put in there as a markup, um, as long as that cost right underneath it is yes, that was the retained profit before I took interest off any 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 interest or, or any any corporation tax that was what I had left before I did any of that or oh, director's remuneration if you if, particularly if you draw down dividends because you can only draw down dividends after you've made a profit so you have to make a profit you have to pay corporation tax and then draw down dividends obviously that's how it works so so that cost would be inclusive of all of that as well Um, and then obviously all of all, all the model then does is is present back to you based on the number of care hours in here, which which is the, the unit of time that we're getting or the unit of service that we're getting paid for. So that's that 42,900. We include all of the costs. We divide that by that 42,900, um, which means which obviously in this in this model, that 900869 should be representative of the branch income across the year. Divide that by the 43,000 hours that we were paid for in various different formats then the effective unit cost per care hour is £21. I'm sure I'm sure what a lot of um, providers are interested in is, OK, well, how does that translate to the price I get paid for care? Um, which is which is obviously an important consideration um, and um, Again, this is where it comes to. This is the really important thing about us developing a model, not a not a data collection. This at current does just as data collection. If you want to model it, you want to present something different. So let's say that this is our organization. This was the blended cost across our organization, and we want to develop a price for different visit lengths. OK, so our volume in our organization is 825 contact hours per week, but at present, that is a blended rate of an average of 39.6 minutes as a visit length, right? Let's say that I want to develop a price for a 30 minute visit. My 30 minute visit price is going to be more than the blended rate here, which is the 21 pounds, okay? And the reason it's going to be more is because of this exact point that I expressed earlier around this travel cost. So what you need to do is as long as your volume is the same, because that's the volume that we budgeted for, that's the volume that we costed for. If you express the number of visits differently. So if I do um, 30 minutes, so if I if I just delete the visits here and then I want to make sure that I still have 825 hours a week, but I want to do 825 hours in 30 minute visits. If I multiply that 825 by two in there, that means that I now need to deliver. I'm going to delete these as well. I now need to deliver 1650 visits per week to get to the same amount of volume of care hours that I'm going to get paid for. So therefore, my unit price for a 30 minute visit is actually £21.87 because I divide that by two, which gives me £10.43, whatever it puts around £10.43 and a half, whatever it is. Um, so that's so for a 30 minute visit, it should be £10.35. Uh, yeah, sorry, £10.45, not um, £10. What was it? Whatever it was, £21 divided by two, which was obviously lower. Um, again, if it's a 15 minute visit, then you would probably want to do, let's do 15 minutes, and then obviously I'm going to multiply that by four to get to, again, I'm trying to get to my 825 volume here for a 15 minute visit. The actual unit cost that I'm using to, to get to the proportion of that is going to be £25.47. So I need to do a quarter of that to get to a price that I want to charge for a 15 minute visit, because that means that economically the balance of visits is going to work out. Okay, if you deliver that blend, um, and and it works out at that cost. It doesn't necessarily matter. But if you're going to differentiate your pricing, um, 
you know, based on all sorts of different visit lengths, then obviously that's how you were, how you would differentiate your pricing, for instance. But again, you've got to keep the volume the same because the volume, everything else, all of your other business costs are dependent on the volume. Same model uses 52 weeks per year, but our LA used 52.143 weeks per year. Can the formulas be amended? Um, no, but what I would say is um, you, the the, um, the the cost what what you what you're looking at is the cost so if the cost per annum regardless of whether some something in here is multiplied by 52 or 52.143 if that cost per annum let's say for so that that cell is like direct staff cost for instance if the cost per annum for that employer's ni actually represents the cost that you know in your provider it's irrelevant of whether the local authority use a different um different number to calculate their their 52th per week or their 52th per 0.143 per week um because this is about your it's about your cost it's irrelevant what the local authority want to do with that because the unit cost will always come back to the same thing because the unit cost is based on the number of hours per annum not the number of um weeks in a year so the number of weeks in a year doesn't matter when it comes to calculating a unit cost it matters what the volume is per annum Um, there is a question. Um, it says we provide 24 hour support to individuals in our home, typically with staff teams of four or five support workers, so there are no visits or travel time. How do we reflect that in the toolkit? Sorry, did you say in a care home? In, oh, sorry, in their own homes. Oh, so, OK, so so the, 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 the provider has four or five um, staff, but they just don't pay for travel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Again, if you don't pay for travel. Um, then don't put any travel time in per visit um, because the, the model is going to is mo model is going to assume that you're paying for travel at five minutes per per every single visit and therefore is going to add 54 k's worth of cost that you don't incur um so if for instance you don't pay for travel but you you have in your t's and c's in your contract with your employers that the hourly rate for care that you actually pay is inclusive of whatever travel needs to be attached to each of those visits or each of those hours worth of face-to-face -face care then the basic rate needs to obviously be amended so for instance and I'll do this as an example. Let's say that this provider actually pays £9.50 an hour um, as a basic rate. Obviously, they pay this blend. OK, they pay this blend. Um, but let's say it's £9.50 an hour, but they pay £9.50 an hour for all of the contact time and they also cost up accurately the travel time that they need to pay for carers at £9.50 an hour. Um, so the cost, the unit cost to this, in fact, no, I won't do it from the unit cost. I'll do it from the pay bill, which would be more helpful. OK. So the pay bill for just contact and travel time based on an uh, based on an organization that advertises a rate at nine pound fifty an hour for contact and travel time is four hundred and eighty two thousand pounds based on this budget model. You appreciate that there's a there's volume in here that is going to be irrelevant for other people. Now, let's say that you actually say, well, no, I pay eleven pounds an hour because that's an attractive rate. Um, but what I assume is that includes travel time. And I'm not going to assume that I pay an extra five minutes per visit for travel. So obviously the basic pay rate is now £11 an hour. I've deleted the travel time and therefore the um, the actual pay bill is 491000 So that's the differential, you know. Um, let me just put that back. So yeah, as per whatever it was, I, it turns out that the provider A, who actually knew that they paid for um, X number of hours based on the travel time that they paid for, um, ha had a pay bill of 482k, but provider B, who paid £11 an hour, but, but just said it's inclusive of whatever travel, doesn't have any estimation of the actual travel time or may do, but again, the pay bill was slightly different. But if it's if that's the case, just don't put anything in travel if you um, if you want to make sure that the pay rate is what you advertise and what you pay for. Um, does the supervision in F cover shadowing calls? 
Um, yes, I would absolutely include anything that you have to pay for. So if you have a carer, if you have a second carer that is not being paid for via an income stream for that second carer because they're not needed, but they are then shadowing someone else, then you you must put an expectation in there as to how many how many additional days per staff member you expect carers to be paid that you are not attracting an income for because you have to you have to cost that in that's part of, that's a, that's almost like a sunk cost in your business so yeah you absolutely should be putting in in any extra payments that you're not getting an income for if if you are um if you if you if you've been getting paid for a double up call and there's a second carer that is obviously getting an income um but um that you know you could also count that as as some kind of supervision session as well for them you're obviously generating an income because that second care is a, is a double up. So I wouldn't necessarily count that, but that's that only happens if you are able to, as an organisation, schedule your, your visits that way and schedule your carers that way. If they're going to be a sunk cost and every time you schedule a carer to do shadowing, you're going to have to pay them extra, then obviously, yeah, you should absolutely include it in the time there. And, um... If buildings are owned, not rented, would would you put it in as a notional cost? Um, you, it's entirely up to you how you how you express that in your accounts. If you, the only thing I would urge is just don't double count anything. So if you want to, um, let's say you own a building and you um, obviously you don't have any mortgage, you don't have any rent, you don't you don't have any lease costs. Your building is now just an asset that sits on your balance sheet. So it's a balance sheet item. It's not a P&L item. And just for clarity from an accounting perspective, this is all considering P&L items. Um, so but, but let's say that you've got a building, you don't have any um, costs attributed. However, what you do do is you apply depreciation to that asset. Um, it might be a building, it might be something else. You apply depreciation to that asset of a value of £2,000 per year. So you are absolutely within, you know, it's just a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet's not going to tell you off for doing something. Um, if you put depreciation in and you say that's £2,000, um, and that's something that you're going to report for tax purposes as well, because obviously you have to report appreciation because it reduces your tax bill. Then, um, then um, yeah, you can put that in because at some point you're going to say that depreciation will turn into an actual cost in one financial year when it comes to me having to renovate and refurb. So that will be a capital cost at some point um, or moving or moving buildings. Um, so. Um, you know, depreciation typically might turn into a capital cost at some point, which is why what you do is you you, you will either straight line it or do a, some kind of log logarithmic um, reduction of cost. But if you want to put that in as depreciation, you can put that in as depreciation. The only thing that um, that I would um, advise you to do is ensure that you are reducing your um, recording of your surplus when it comes to profit surplus contribution by the same amount, because if you were doing, um, if you were recording depreciation up here, then you are no longer having to account for that cost in your profit line. This is this is a much bigger issue when it comes to care homes, residential and nursing homes than it than it is probably in home care. Although I appreciate someone's asked the question, so clearly there are, there are businesses out there that actually own their own buildings and things. Um, but but yeah, just just don't double count, but agnostic about where you put it, as long as you make it clear what it is. Um, do, do, do. Um, total average care staff per annum. Is this the number? Is this number just new staff that have been recruited or all staff, including existing? Um, yeah, so so all staff, including existing. Um, if you. And again, this is a this is a, a nuance of developing a cost model for a, for a to help providers and commissioners say, I want to build something here. I don't just want to look at what things cost. The use case here in this, in in respect to the fair cost of care, is a is a is a is a bit of a niche and not not an ideal use case, if we're honest. But but um, but to answer that question as from a from a costing perspective, it would be all new and existing. But it would be the relatively difficult and it's a complex thing to do, but it would be an average of that. So let's say that you have on average 50 care staff 
on uh, in your uh, yeah if you have 50 care staff um i'm just going off the example here if you have 50 care staff in a business um on average you might have 70 at one point because you did a big recruitment uh, you might have 20 at another point in your business um, so as long as the average is representative of, of, of that, and um, I mean, the only two things, the only two things that this staff represents when it comes to you saying, well, how does it affect the model in terms of where do I make sure that I've costed everything in? The only two things that the number of care staff actually affect is the training and supervision cost here. So that 20k that's obviously just been generated here and the employers and I cost here. OK, so if you obviously and again, as we've just as you just talked about, if I put less then the employers and I cost goes up, but the training cost goes down. But the proportion of the two is that the employers and I cost goes up slightly more than the um, than the training cost comes down. Now, that's not to say that you might have more training costs because actually there were 20 new starters across the year that started and you paid them for a day's worth of um, uh, paid them for a day's worth of training that they never ended up doing any work for you, uh, which is a big problem, a big problem in home care. Um, so if there are any additional costs that you just say, well, look, I need to I need to just put in some induction costs that are not um, that are not calculated, that, that I'm not comfortable representing there, then um, please, all I do, all I'd urge you to do is represent it somewhere else. So, you know, you've got the overheads line here if you want to put in the training costs that you've that were over and above something because of inductions and things. The other thing I would obviously keep in mind as well is for every individual staff member, it's it's unlikely that I mean you you would you would typically do training on an annual basis um, and you would do induct so let's say year one of someone's employment you would do induction training which is a whole raft of training and then you would not do your refresher training until 12 months after that. So given the fact that you're looking at a 12 month period each staff member should would typically only ever have a set of induction training that they're doing because they're newly employed or a set of mandatory refresher training. Um, so typically, typically. But again, my only thing I can say about that is don't leave any extra costs out if you're saying that's not representative of my cost. It's regarding the breakdown of living hours, um, but also how to report sleepings and the Xmas rate, double time for X for Christmas. Uh, yes, um, yeah, good point. So uh, again, um, I have to just say, you know, there is there is a level of complexity that's um, uh, not necessarily, it was difficult to put even more in and, and I, I read some of the comments about and, and thank you for uh, there's some really nice comments here about thank you for kind of presenting such a complex subject in a hopefully a, 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 a relatively thought out way. But yeah, there's, there's some things there, there are some nuances that just require providers to think critically about how they want to present these things. And we just can't do that um, necessarily in the model, but without adding another another dimension to this. But what I would say is so there's two things there. One was sleeping and the other one was um, bank holidays. I tackle the sleeping one first. So with regards to sleepings, let's say that you um, this is your 60, 30 and 45 minutes. This represents the core kind of standard daytime personal care. And then you have a sleeping um, uh, portion of your business. And um, let's say it's what would it be? It'd probably be eight hours, wouldn't it? So 480 minutes. And let's say you do um, 20 sleepings a week. So I don't know why that's coming to do two decimals. I'll um, it just looked a bit weird. OK, so there's another 160 hours worth of sleepings in this model now because this is the blended provider model. OK, what you'll also notice two things. One is it, it obviously increases the blended average visit length. Um, but also the volume here. Um, you know, it's. Um, excuse me. Excuse me, I really did eat my wheat bits too fast this morning. Um, yeah, I've got a blended average visit rate um, there that it affects. When it comes to modelling the cost for those sleepings, so um, I've got to I've got to basically try and figure this out. But essentially, what I'm saying is there is 160 hours of care time a week that I need to factor in for sleepings. And let's say that my um, I'm going to use this unsociable 
raw. No, in fact, I'm going to get rid of the nurse and I'm going to say sleeping okay? because my, I pay my carer a specific rate for sleeping. And let's say that I pay my carer um, 90 pounds as a as a flat rate. Right. So it's but I know that my sleeping I'm counting as an eight hour period of time. So 90 divided by eight, which gives us um, uh, eight, uh, 11 pounds 25, 11 pounds 25. Um, right. Yeah, that is right. OK. Now what I know is um, there's 160 hours worth of sleepings that um, I need to apply that rate to. So um, and that is um, 160 out of the 985 hours total a week. So I'm going to say that 160 uh, divided by 985 um, gives me 16.2 percent. So 16.2 percent of my whole business. I think that's right. Let me just check. Um, let me just check the. I'm going to check it by doing this. Multiply by 52. 8320. Yeah, 8320. It's right. Yeah. So the proportion of 160 out of 985 gives us that 83. Gives us that 16.2 percent. So what I'm saying is, for my sleeping rate, I'm costing my sleeping hours, my same sleeping hours at the rate that I pay my sleeping. Um, so that's how I would do that. When it comes to bank holiday and um, particularly when and, and this one in terms of if you pay a different rate for Christmas um, and New Year's Day, for instance, as opposed to every other bank holiday of the year. Um, you, Yeah, we haven't split this out. And again, it was just it was adding another column to the model. It was it, it was going to just add another level of complexity. But what I would do is just do a blended rate there. So if it's if it's 50 percent on every bank holiday bar Christmas and Christmas and New Year, there are eight bank holidays in a year. So what you're doing is two of those bank holidays you are um, you are doing a rate of one. Um, so I'm going to do two times one. Um, and then I'm going to do um, one uh, six of those bank holidays and then charging a rate of 0.5. Yeah, so I'm going to adding 0.5 as a premium or 50 percent as a premium to six out of my eight bank holidays and I'm adding 100 percent, which is just one as a decimal as a, as a number to two of them. So if I do two two times one um, and then six times 0.5, my blended rate, and I just need to divide that by. Uh, oops, sorry. Where's my? I've lost my formula bar. Oh. Okay, that's my formula bar. Um, if I do that, divide by hundred. Uh, It by 10 because it was just the way I did the decimals. But essentially your blended your blended bank holiday rate is 60 percent. That's what your blended bank holiday rate is. Um, yeah, I, hopefully that was helpful. 